Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. We will be looking at the 15th chapter of the book of Romans this morning. So get your Bible out and uh, open it up there. Be ready to follow along with me as we do this. Let me go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer and we will get started. Lord, we come to you this morning just thanking you and praising you for loving us, for giving us the opportunity to, to study your word. Even though we can't do it in person, I, I thank you that we're able to do this uh, over the, the internet. Uh, Lord, praise you for the, the blessings that you provide for us. Uh, Lord, do pray for our church uh, in this difficult time. I pray that you will help us to grow close together. I pray that you will help us to learn how to how to serve one another even as we are distant from each other. Uh, Lord, do pray for those in our church family that have, have gotten this virus. I pray that you will bless them. Uh, I pray that you will heal them. Lord, I pray that those that, um, uh, that have not gotten the virus, that you might protect them and uh, guard them and keep them safe. Lord, we put our faith and trust totally in you. Lord, this morning as we uh, study your word, give us wisdom, give us understanding, and give us the ability to apply the truths that we see to our lives. Lord, we'll give you all the glory and honor and praise. These things I pray in your name. Amen. All right. In this section of Romans that we've been looking at, uh, we've been asking the question every week, you know, how can I live a Christian life in a messed up world? Uh, now that we've seen that we have given ourselves sacrificially to God, and as we are using our spiritual gifts to minister to one another, and as we relate properly to the secular government and to society, and as we fulfill our greatest need, our greatest responsibility, which is to love people, uh, last week we began to look at um, uh, how do we deal with disagreements and and different opinions within the church. And we saw that uh, we can have different opinions and still work together. Um, uh, and we need to judge the actions that we take. That's what we called convictions. But we never judge the people. The people of the church are God's people and God will judge them. So we, we have to learn to be able to accept people even when our actions differ, okay? And it, it's critical because the image that we present to the world needs to be a reflection of God's love. Uh, that's what he said when he said that uh, by this all men will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. We need to love in the church and work together. This week we're going to continue that look at relationships in the church, and in fact, uh, throughout the rest of the uh, the book, that's what we're looking at is uh, the relationships that take place in the church. And so um, uh, as we continue that, let me go ahead and begin reading. I'm going to read the first four verses of the 15th chapter. It says, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves, each of us should please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Strong Christians versus weak Christians. Which one are you? And how can you tell? Well, what he talks about here is that the strong Christian doesn't please himself, but he pleases his neighbor. He pleases the other person that's in the church. He pleases the one he's serving. He works for his good. All of us want to look at ourselves as being the strong Christian in this issue and the other person is being the weak Christian. Um, the strong Christian works for his neighbor's good. You know, when we read that idea of pleasing his neighbor, um, sometimes our idea of pleasing isn't necessarily what this is saying because 
Um, uh, we don't do what they want necessarily. We do what's good for them. What's good for them is what they really want in the end, uh, but they don't realize that always. And so, uh, so we need to work for their good. We need to work toward building them up. Um, that's the essence of Christian love. If you love someone, you, instead of pleasing yourself, instead of looking at your own situation, you look at others' situations. Uh, instead of worrying about your own problems, you look at their problems. You try to please them, you try to work for their good, you try to build them up. Putting others ahead of yourself is the essence of Christian love. So, are you the strong Christian or the weak Christian? You know, I think that most of us will recognize that sometimes I'm in the position of being the strong Christian, while other times I'm obviously the weak one in the situation. Um, and um, that's okay. That, that's, that's kind of the way it works sometimes, but we need to be working together and hopefully more and more often we are the strong one helping the weak one. Um, will the world understand this when they see this happening, when they see me selflessly helping someone else? No. Um, they will still insult us. They will still uh, uh, fight against us. And you notice what it says there. The insults that, uh, that they aim at us actually fall on Jesus. Um, and so that's, I, I need to realize that, that when they talk badly about me doing what is good for other people, that they are actually attacking Jesus. And so, uh, so I need to recognize that and see that. Um, uh, notice, though, uh, through all of this, God wants us to have hope. Okay? And we will get hope through two things that he mentions here. These two things aren't necessarily easy, but, but they're two things that are going to lead us and going to help us to have the hope that God wants us to have. The first one is endurance, and the second one is encouragement of the scripture. Endurance. What is that? Well, having endurance isn't always pleasant. Because it means putting up with things that I would just as soon not have to put up with. It means um, uh, not giving up on, uh, on people and on things that are difficult and uh, that are hard. And yet the things that I am going through. It means that I never quit. It means that I, that I recognize where I'm headed and who has me and who holds my life and and so I never quit and I never give up. Endurance requires that I have discipline and self-discipline is not always an easy thing for me to have or for me to do but it requires me to have the discipline to stick with it and to keep going and to do what I know I need to do in spite of what all's going on around me. The second one is encouragement of the scriptures. Now notice, it's not just any old encouragement. It's not just somebody coming up and patting me on the back or putting their arm around me and saying, uh, you know, saying, that's okay, we're gonna get through this together. Now I need that kind of encouragement too. But what he's talking about here is the encouragement of the scriptures. Um, uh, encouragement from God's word. That means it involves reading God's Word. I can't get encouragement from God's Word unless I'm spending some time in God's Word. Um, it also requires discipline because not only do I need to read God's Word, but I need to apply it to my life. I need to, to pay attention to what it says. And I will receive hope from those two things. Um, uh, Without them, without those two things, guess what? 
I'm going to end up feeling quite hopeless. In fact, I believe much of our world today uh, is in despair and, uh, and depression and a lot of hopelessness uh, because they are not doing these two things. They don't have the endurance that, that they need and they don't um, uh, read the scriptures, okay? And so if they were to, to do those two things, they could gain hope. Let's go on to verses 5 through 9. He says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. And I'll stop right there. Notice, who gives this endurance and encouragement that I know I'm going to have to work hard and that I know I'm going to have to have the discipline in order to get well those are gifts from God uh, they do involve my work they do involve my effort they do involve my discipline but they are actually given to me by God and when we the church the people of God do this now you know when getting a group of people a uh, group of Baptists all to do something at the same time is almost impossible. But you know what? When we, God's people, work together and, and do this um, by, getting, by having endurance, by uh, getting the encouragement of the scriptures, notice what we get. Um, says we have a spirit of unity. Okay? That's going to unify us. Um, and it's exhibited, he gives here two ways in which that is exhibited. First, it is exhibited through one heart. In other words, we have one goal. We have one desire as a church. We have one purpose as a church. That's what unity is, and that's what it means to have a heart of unity. We are wanting to accomplish the same thing. We, we are, our heart's desire is the same thing for our church. Even if there are times when we see ourselves going at it in different ways, we have that one desire for our church. That's the first thing it's exhibited by. And the second thing it's exhibited through is one mouth. This one maybe is the tough one for us to say or for us to do. Um, it's, it's easy for us to talk about having one heart uh, even when our hearts are divided. Um, uh, but we need to, to exhibit this through one mouth. In other words, our words should support the desire and the purpose of the church, even if we disagree on disputable matters. Now, you remember last week when we talked about disputable matters. I can think one thing needs to be done, you can think another thing needs to be done. We can have a disagreement about those things. Those are disputable matters when there are things that God has not specifically giving a, given us direction on. Um, in other words, if the church is doing something that you disagree with, that is a disputable matter. Now, I'm not talking about the church doing something that, you know, God says this is wrong and, and don't do this, so... Um, so when those things are not disputable matters, that's a difference. But when the church is doing something and, and you disagree that that's the, the thing they need to do, you have a responsibility to work within the church, within the church body, um, to uh, possibly correct the issue, to at least get a better understanding of the issue, uh, but to work within the group of the church. Okay, you also have a responsibility not 
to speak against the church's actions publicly outside the church okay it's it's critical because this whole section this whole last couple of three chapters that we're looking at here is really talking about how the church relates within the church and the image it projects outside the church um, if you disagree with something that the church is doing and you post how dumb it is for the church to do that on Facebook think about the image you're putting forth of the church and not just of the church but of Jesus you have a responsibility not to do that okay um, you may disagree with it uh, you don't have to, to, to post something in favor of it but don't speak against it okay that's what it means when it says one mouth one voice okay so that we're saying the same thing together we should have the same desire and the same purpose and the same goal and so now we need to to express that with with one mouth with one voice uh, don't post on Facebook a bunch of stuff a, a bunch of negative stuff about your church because people who read that who are not Christians won't see that as a slight disagreement in your church what they will see is that 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 it must be silly to be a Christian because obviously they can't get it right either okay so you have a responsibility to to speak with one mouth with the church it says to accept one another then just as Christ accepted you okay well, let me ask you how did Christ accept you when you became a Christian did you have to get everything straightened out in your life before he would accept you did you have to get all your mistakes taken care of before he would accept you no of course not um, uh, in fact when Christ accepts me and saves me he forgives me of all my sins but he doesn't immediately throw all the guilt on top of me and and tell me that I have to change everything all at once uh, he changes me day by day by day time by time I think God often changes us a little at a time because he knows we can't handle that fast to change and so you know what God is still working on me he hasn't fixed everything in me yet and I doubt that he's fixed everything in you yet because when he gets everything fixed in me he's gonna take me home to heaven okay um, I need to accept you the way Jesus accepted me in other words I know you're not perfect and um, uh, I don't want to accept your sin so actions that I see in you that maybe you're not right that are sinful actions um, I God may use me to point those out to you God may use me in a different way rather than pointing them out um, but uh, I don't need to accept your actions I do need to accept you and it's critical that we realize that that's two different things um, what someone does is not who they are and I can accept who they are in spite of what they do sometimes I want you to notice what he says there he says that Christ became a servant of the Jews now notice he, he didn't say Jesus became I, I think it's important that he used the word Christ there he says the Messiah the promised one the King of Kings became a servant you know that's exactly the the picture he's trying to to show is that Jesus could have demanded that I be his servant instead he became my servant and he became a servant of the Jews the Jews who were expecting a king who were expecting of the conquering hero he became their servant why in order to showcase he did it on behalf of and he did it to showcase um, God's truth and confirm God's promises that he made to the patriarchs what truth is is Jesus confirming by becoming a servant and by living the life that he did 
with the truth that he's confirming is the gospel, the good news. The fact that God loves you. God wants to change you. God cares enough about you to do something about it. He wants to save you. And uh, it's not through my works that I'm going to be saved. It's not through being good enough that I'm going to be saved. It is the promise of heaven. The promise that he gave the patriarchs are, are, is that he would be their God and they would be his people. It's the promise that I get to be God's people. Okay? And so, so he promises that. And he confirms that by becoming my servant. So I need to accept you the way that Jesus accepted me. And I need to recognize that what Jesus also did was he became a servant of people in order to, to uh, highlight, in order to bring out God's truth that he loves me. And so I need to be doing the same kind of thing. Now, I'm going to go on down to verse 13 and read verse 13, and then we're going to stop there today. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is the God of hope. And so we, we've looked at all this stuff where, where you know, I'm going to be um, insulted, um, I, I've got weak brothers that I'm going to have to put up with. Uh, I have to um, uh, be, uh, I have to have the, the encouragement of the scriptures. I have to have the endurance. Uh, I have to do all of these things that I need to be, be looking at. But you know what? God is a God of hope. He wants to fill you with, now notice he doesn't say he wants to fill you with hope. You're, you're going to be filled with hope. But what he wants to fill you with is joy and joy and peace and in this messed up world uh, you will get real joy and real peace only by trusting Jesus that's what he says here he says you will get those with all joy and peace as you trust in him you have to put your trust in Jesus to get real joy and peace when you trust Jesus the Holy Spirit will cause your life to overflow with hope to those around you. Non-Christians won't understand this because it's not in their lives. But they'll want it when they see it in your life because they'll see how in this messed up world it seems like, in spite of all the things that are going wrong, that you have joy and you have peace, how does that happen? And not only joy and peace, but you seem to have hope of what's coming. So the question becomes, what is overflowing in your life to those Christians and non-Christians who are around you? Because you see this whole thing here that we've been looking at, this is how you live a Christian life in a messed up world. Let me close today with a prayer. Lord, we, we want joy in our lives and peace in our lives. In spite of all the issues and the struggles and the problems that are going on in our lives, they can't touch the joy and peace that you put in there. Lord, I pray that, uh, that your Holy Spirit will help my life to overflow in that joy and peace so that other people will see it, so that my brothers and sisters in Christ will see it, and they will see a way to live in a messed up world that will, that will glorify you. I pray that it will overflow to those who are not Christians who will see it and will say, man, whatever he's got, that's what I want. They won't understand it. They may become jealous. They may become angry. And yet, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will help that hope to overflow from my life to theirs. Lord, be with us this, this coming week. 
help us to, um, even as we are staying home, even as we are behind our mask, even as we are, are trying to stay safe, help us to minister to people around us. Help people to see your love in all of this. And Lord, we'll give you the glory and the praise. These things I pray in your name. Amen.